How many of you glad you came out today? It's a good day. I'm excited about it. Typically, Bob said we start our new series. We kick it off next Sunday called That's My Church. And if, if you are new to Real Life Church, or maybe you've been here for a little while and you haven't heard us talk through it, I'm going to spend the next four weeks talking through why we do what we do at Real Life Church. What's the mission behind it? What's the, what's the, what's the Bible that drives what we do? And so we're going to talk through our core values. And, and, and because there's a reality when I hear people and they go, oh, you know Real Life. And I'm like, that's my church. That's where I go. And it's not me saying that's mine because I pastor it. It's where I go. It's, it's the people that I do community with. It's the, the life groups that I love, the classes that we do, the worship that we get to experience, all of it. This, God has allowed me to be a part of this just as much as he's allowed you to be a part of it. So that's coming next Sunday. Bring somebody to it. If they go, man, I had some questions about that. This is the series to bring them to. All right. If they want, if they want to know who we are, what we're about, and what the mission is to reach one more soul, one more family, and one more community with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's what we're going to spend the next several weeks talking about. So be ready for that. While you have your Bible, or if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and turn with me to Joshua chapter ten. I love the Old Testament. It's my favorite part of the Bible. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Jesus. Okay. But I, I just love the, the richness of the people and the stories in the Old Testament. And, and we see some audacious kind of things happen in the Old Testament, especially where we're going to be reading today. And it is themed, okay, it's Cosmic Sunday, so I had to talk about the sun and, and the stars and all that good stuff today. So we're going to hit on that. But I have a question. How many of you have ever, how many of you have ever bought fireworks at a fireworks stand? I was going to say, where are my rednecks at? <laughs> so, me too. So, how many of you have ever bought too many? Some of you are like, what? <laughs> All right, now let me ask you the next question because we're about to go another level. How many of you have ever worked at a fireworks stand? Okay, so you people understand what I'm about to talk about. It's an interesting question that always gets asked at fireworks stands. It's a repetitive question and gets asked by typically about anybody that comes, especially those that are going to spend a little bit of money at a fireworks stand. And the question typically is a simple question, but it gets asked repetitively. Some of you understand this, but let me give you the question. The question is always, what's this one do? And early on, you'll be like, well, that one, when you light it, it shoots up in the air about 75, 80 feet, <laughs> blows up, just a smoke ball on the top of that one, not a lot of stuff. What's this one do? <laughs> that when you light it, goes up in the air, red, blue, green, just all sparkles. Thing one comes up, looks like a weeping willow tree comes down. And, and man, early on, you're like, this is amazing. Woo, this when you light it, it goes up and a dragon appears and eats a lion, and it's amazing. <laughs> How many of you would buy that firework? Yeah. <laughs> it has nothing to do with Revelation, in case you're wondering. So. But that's what you get early on. What's that one do? What's that one do? What's that one do? But then by the end of the weekend, <laughs> so what's that one do? It blows up. <laughs> in fact, let me stop you. They all blow up. In various ways, they just blow up. You light it, it blows up. That's what, that's what you get, right? How many of you have been there? If you don't know what I'm talking about in regards to fireworks, how many of you have kids? You have a kid come in, they want to show you something awesome because everything a child does, especially between the ages of two and, hmm, I'm not going to put it in you know? <laughs> It's awesome, Right? And they want to come tell you, and they come tell you, this was, I want to, Dad, like I can remember the little ones coming in. I got a cartwheel, let me show you this cartwheel, let me show you this cartwheel, this cartwheel, this cartwheel. I'm saying, okay. Yesterday it was funny, we were, we were at a soccer match, and Brinley, Brinley struggles a little bit with some dexterity and balance, and so, and so she's really cautious. She's very cautious. And so Brinley, you know, you'll see a lot of kids that are like, woo, just like that, man. They're jumping. Brinley, yesterday we were on the bleachers, and I was like, come here, babe. And she got right to the end of it, and she was like, And she looked at me and she got, she was about this far off the bottom step. And she was like, woo! <laughs> <laughs> the 
of course, I did what dads are supposed to do. I was like, yeah, that's right. That's my kid. And we're jumping around. But after about the 50th time, can you just come down the stairs? <laughs> like, I, look, I don't, look, you want, you, your somersault is amazing, but put a back handspring on that dude, then I'll watch again. But right now, you, you're boring me with the same thing over and over and over. <laughs> Parents, your children in children's church, it's okay. How many of you are with me? I <laughs> fear that we sometimes get this way with our relationship with Christ. And our faith kind of runs into this. Man, when we, first, when we first were introduced to Jesus, we believed all kinds of stuff about him. We believed he was able. We believed he was willing. We believed he was on our side. We believed he could pick us up and stand us up. We believed he could walk us through the fire. We believed he could part the seas. We could believe all that stuff. And then after a little while into the faith and a little while into our Christian walk, people go, so what's that one do? And you go, well, it gets me to heaven. I don't have to stay in this whole world much longer. I get tickled at people that are always about, seems like he's coming soon. He's always been coming soon. Since the moment he left, the clock started ticking on when he was coming back. And we, we, we get a little, I'm trying to think of the right word and I don't want to be offensive. We just get a little lazy in our faith. We get to the point where it's kind of like, well, I expect God to do some things, but I actually don't believe he will do all those things. So in Joshua chapter 10, we have this moment where Joshua, who, I'm going to give you some backstory. Joshua is, he's awesome. If you haven't read the story of Joshua in the Bible, I challenge you to do it. You're going to have to pick way back up because Joshua came through the wilderness with Moses and the children of Israel. So Joshua was one of the early spies that went in, but Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that came back and was like, let's do it. Let's go. What, what do you mean? Well, let's go. We got it. God, if God's with us, who can be against us? Let's go. Let's go shake some stuff up. Let's go. And the other spies were like, no, no, no. And what happened after that was 40 years of wandering around. And just before they get to the Jordan River to cross over to go into the promised land, Moses dies. Now, that's a longer sermon than I have time to preach today, but Moses dies, and as Moses dies, he hands the keys to the car, metaphorically speaking, to Joshua. Now, so Joshua now is the man. He's the leader of over several million Jewish people. You're like, several million? Yeah. When there's not a lot to do in the wilderness for 40 years, <laughs> you make babies. And the Jewish people made a bunch of them over 40 years. So there's several million people by this time getting ready to cross over the Jordan into the promised land. We've been waiting. An entire generation has died off while we've been waiting to get into the promised land. And so they come into the promised land and Joshua has this promise from God himself that he will, he will stand and the nation of Israel will stand. And so he goes to Jericho. You all know the story. Marches around seven times. Give a shout. Everybody shout. The walls come tumbling down. It's a great story. He goes into AI. God gives him specific instructions. Don't leave anyone. Don't leave anyone. I need you to come in and I need you to take over the land. But then in chapter 9 of Joshua, we have this moment where Joshua doesn't quite, doesn't quite do what God asked him to do. So it gets him in a little bit of a pinch. And so now there are these five kingdoms that have decided they're going to come against Joshua. And they're going to come against this nation of Gibeon where, that, that, where Joshua has had this alliance built. And so Joshua goes to God and he says, God, I, I need your help. I'm going into battle. And so I'm going to start in verse Seven of Joshua chapter 10. I'm going to read through the whole thing, then we're going to just try to pick some of it apart. Tell some, I'm going to give you three things that this passage teaches us, that Joshua teaches us. So Joshua chapter 10, verse 7, it says, So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. In verse 8, And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. And not a man of them shall stand before you. Now, I want you to understand some of the tense in this passage, just in those two verses. The Bible tells us that Joshua and his men are going to war, yet God speaks up and says, I've already won it. 
God speaks about the problem in the past tense to Joshua. I have already given them to your hand. Future tense, not a one of them will stand. And I want to give you some perspective on this today because I don't know what battle you're fighting. I don't know what war you're in. Or maybe you're not. Maybe you're just chilling. Maybe it's good right now. Maybe life is good. But how many of you know it's coming? It's coming. We, we, in this life, there will be trouble is what the Bible tells us. And so there is a battle that is coming, whether it's in your family, whether it's in your community, whether it's in you personally, a spiritual battle that you have to fight. I need you to understand that we got, the God we serve lives outside of our circumstances and he is not overwhelmed by yours. That so long as you're with, hey, God, here I am. He says, hey, Joshua, I'm with you and I've already won the battle that you're on your way to. Just trust me. We just sang it. Some of y'all got loud and rowdy on it. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. See, you, already, you know. It always amazes me that we'll know the words in a song, but we won't live them in our life. And so we get this passage where now God has said, Joshua, I got you. We pick up in verse 9. So... Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. Now, what he's doing is he's going from Gilgal, which is over here. He's going over to Gibeon over here, and he shocks them. They're surprised they don't see him. Uh, I wish I had a map. It'd make it easier for you to understand other than me pointing at the stars. Okay. But they're walking on this journey, and they start to chase him. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and then chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Haran. And then they struck them as far as Azekah and Makeda. Those are a lot like Gasville and Cotter. Okay, I'm just kidding. They're nothing like Gasville and Cotter, but I wanted you to stay with me. So to understand this, and you try to get this picture in your mind, sometimes we feel like when we start studying battles in the Bible, we have this imagery of this big valley, and everybody comes in the valley and rumbles. No, no, Joshua shocked them by showing up in the middle of the night, and it rattled them, and God said he confused them before they got there, so they were already rattled. And so they took off running, and Joshua began to follow them. From Gibeon to this valley of Beth Haran, the lower Beth Haran Valley, it's about 30 miles and they chased them 30 miles. And then they took a left and turned south down to Ezekiel and Makeda. And that's about a hundred mile radius that they chased these guys down. Because God said, don't leave a one. So they keep going, Joshua verse 12. At that time, excuse me, let me get verse 11. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Haran. Check this out. The Lord threw down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Ezekiel, and they died. God showed up. Why? Because God made a promise. And I don't know if you know this or not, but God keeps his promises. In fact, Scripture tells us here that there were more who died because of the hailstones than the ones that Joshua and his armies killed. And so at that time, imagine this, as you're running down through the valley, you're fighting a battle for the Lord, and you were winning, and you were running down, and you, you look up, and as you are slaying the enemy, all of a sudden, a truck-sized hailstone hits the ground. I'm a little concerned if it's me, all right? I stand in my garage and watch it hail when it hails here, but if... I don't know, very large hailstone from biblical proportions, I'm guessing truck size. I may be wrong, okay? It doesn't say, it just says large. But enough to kill more people than what the sword did for Joshua's entire army. And so they're running, and I'm sitting here thinking, and then Joshua, as he's chasing down the fight, starts to look around. And he realizes they've not quite finished the task but he also realizes something really bad is happening. And what's happening is, is it's about to get dark. It's about to get dark. Some of you know the history of the Jewish people and a lot of their calendar is based on sunrise and sunset. And actually sunset and sunrise in that order. 
And so Joshua looks up and he's chasing down these enemy soldiers and he's chasing down the people that God told him to, to get rid of. And as he's chasing them down, he looks up and realizes there's an issue. And so Joshua prays the craziest prayer that there may be in the Bible. But he prays this in verse 12. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said, in the sight of Israel, in front of everybody there, son, stand still at Gibeon. And moon, let me make sure I pronounce it right, at Ajalon. You say, wait, he couldn't see both the sun and the moon. Yeah, you can. Some days, right? Now, catch this. This is kind of interesting because it says in verse 13, and the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Listen to the question. Is it not written in the book of Jashar? This was actually documented. This moment was documented in another book. This isn't just a Bible story that's happening. Is it not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of the heavens and it did not hurry to set for about a whole day. And there has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man. And I love the last part of it. For the Lord fought for Israel. It's big stuff right there. Big stuff. Now, I'm not going to talk about some of the ramifications of Israel and for and against and all that. I have my opinions, and if you'd like to talk about that, we definitely can. It's not what I'm preaching today. What I'm preaching today is the reality that this human being, this man who followed God, trusted God enough to ask for something absolutely nuts. And God showed up. God showed up. Like, showed up in the moment and did it. And the sun stood still. Like, you know those people that watch the clock? How many of you work with people that watch the clock? You know they were mad that day, right? <laughs> They're like, we've been fighting all day. <sighs> Come on. <laughs> but this, Joshua praying this prayer, and I want to just walk through a couple things as we break this passage down. And you say, well, it's, yeah, that's Joshua, Pastor Vince. Sometimes it's easy for us to believe, for you and I to believe. That when we read the Bible, we go, yeah, well, yeah, but of course he's got Joshua or Moses or Paul or Peter. Man, those guys could pray that stuff and those things would happen. Some of you even believe that like, well, man, if Billy Graham prayed it or Pastor Vince prayed it, I mean, this is what you guys do. So like if you prayed that, but you, Pastor Vince, God's not making the sun stand still for those of us trying to raise middle schoolers. That ain't happening. Or I'd be like, God, sun stand still. And I'd be freezing that kid. <laughs> I don't know that he's going to do it for me. I don't know that he'll do it for me. There's a reality to that. Some of you will trust God's answer for the person next to you more than you'll believe it for yourself. Oh, I, God, I'm coming to you in prayer, hoping that you heal this and you do this and you're, you're around for that for these people. But I want to give you a scripture. It's a New Testament scripture, and it's one that I use often, but it says this in Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is, come on church, able. Do you know your God is able? Do you know he's able? Say amen if you do. Do you trust that he's able? That one's tougher. If we're just being honest, I, listen, I I am a pastor of an amazing church. God has done miraculous things through this body. Okay? This body of believers. I don't know if I'm to the place of faith yet where I'm standing up in front of all of you telling God to make the sun not move. I'm just being honest with you. I don't, I, I, that's a big one. And yet we see it in Joshua's life. You say, yeah, but so what do I do, Vince? If you, if you don't see it, if you don't have enough faith to do it, what am I supposed to do? I just want to back off of the obvious here and go, maybe your sun stand still moment isn't necessarily the sun standing still. 
Maybe the big crazy thing you need to ask God for is something very tangible in your night life, and you've been so afraid to ask it that it seems like you'd be asking for the sun to stand still. Maybe it's for your marriage. Maybe it's for your kids. Maybe, I don't know what it's for, but maybe this sun stand still thing that you need to do in your life, that you need to say in your life, is something that you just got to get before God and say, Lord, I don't even know if I understand what I'm asking you, which we will see, because there's some lessons we learn from Joshua in this passage. And I want to get into that because the story teaches us a couple of things. And, and I want to give you this quote, and I love this. It says this about God. If the size of the need that you have in your life seems too big for you, then it's right in the wheelhouse of God. But don't miss that God is not just the God of the big. He's the God of the always and the everything. And so let's get into the lessons that it teaches. This first thing, the story teaches us that God can deliver you out of situations that you get yourself into. Somebody say amen. Amen. (laughs) How many of you ever got yourself into some stuff? How many of you are good at it? Yeah. Like, (laughs) Pastor Vince, are you sure this isn't a gift? For some people it may be. God, I keep getting into stuff, and, and you keep getting me out. I always get tickled. People are like, man, I got pulled over for it by a cop. And I'm like, why are you mad? Because I got pulled over by a cop. And I'm like, were you speeding? Yeah. <laughs> you got yourself into it, and you're praying God. Some of you right now, it's not as, maybe it's not as, maybe it's not as small as speeding. Maybe it's like, God, I got myself into this. I married this person, and it's a mess. Don't look. Stay right up here. <laughs> They're right up here. God, I'm in debt, and I was just foolish, and God, I I chased my entire life for money and success, and what I finally realized is that money doesn't bring meaning, and now I don't know what to do. I'm in a mess. God, my kids are not following Jesus. In fact, I don't know where they are at all, and it's a mess. And I want you to tell from Joshua's story, Joshua should not have been fighting this battle. This isn't one God said, no, it's okay, Joshua, go just do whatever. No, he had very specific instructions on what to do, and he messed it up. And God still showed up. So for some of you right now, I know the enemy has convinced you that you messed it up. And since you've messed it up, there's no picking it up. There's no fixing it. There's no making it right. But I'm telling you, the God of creation has already said, because he is outside your circumstances, saying, I've already handed you the victory. I just need you to show up. I just need you to show up. So the Bible teaches us that he can get us out of situations that we put ourselves into. Now, please don't hear this as a get out of jail free card. That's not what this is. It's just a loving father coming to our aid. Second thing this story teaches us is it not only teaches us that he can deliver us, but it also teaches us that we need to pray big prayers. We need to pray some big stuff. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I grew up in churches like this, and maybe you do that. Maybe maybe y'all's faith is bigger than mine. But how many of you have ever prayed something that sounds a little bit like this? Lord, be with me today. Anybody? Yeah. Did you think he wasn't going to be? I don't know that God doesn't kind of go, what? You, did they just, Jesus, did they just ask if we would be with them? Yeah, dad, they did. Did they not read the book? I know we told them a lot that we would be with them, that we would never forsake them, that we would be beside them, that we would walk the valley with them. We said it a lot of different ways, but yet we get stuck praying this thing as if God for something was like, you know what, Joe, I thought about taking the day off. It's going to leave you to it today. No. No, but what happens is we get convinced we have to pray for the things God has already promised us, and we neglect praying for the things that will change the world. We neglect praying for the things that will change our world. 
Well, you don't know what, I don't know what you've been through and I don't know what your family's going through and I don't know what your marriage is going through, but those are big things you lay on the altar before God and say, God, I'm gonna trust you. But then, what, what if he doesn't answer? Listen, I get it, I told you. It'd be tough for me to be Joshua right here because the reality is if God doesn't answer Joshua's prayer, we're not reading the book of Joshua. Think about that. We're going to be reading about Joshua's nephew whose crazy uncle started screaming at the sky for the sun to stop. We don't pray the right stuff. We don't pray big enough. I love the fact that in Joshua's story, he even prayed the wrong thing. How many of you know how the solar system works? The sun doesn't move. It's us that goes around it. I love that God understood, that Joshua understood what he understood, and he prayed anyway. Hey, good news for you and I, you may not always pray it right, but if you pray in faith, God can make it right. God can make it right. There have been times I've prayed for things in my life that God answered in a way completely different than I would have asked or even dreamed of, and it was perfect in the moment. The timing was perfect. The response was perfect. The answer was perfect because God showed up in the way that only he can show up. You say, Pastor Vince, I'm, I have made a mess. I have prayed the wrong things and God is still faithful. Don't over, don't ever get over the fact that this thing that happened to you at salvation is a miracle as big as the sun standing still. It was death to life. You got up out of that old Jew and stepped into something new. And God is still able to do that today in your life, whether that be with your kids, your marriage, your job, your whatever it is, he is still able. Oh, good, Pastor Vince, I was hoping that I could just rub the lamp, yell out at God, and he would just do what I ask. Not quite what I said. Because we gotta finish the lesson the story teaches us. And it actually happens all the way back up at the beginning. We see this. God gets us out of things that we get ourselves into. God teaches us in this story to pray big prayers. But he also teaches us that we've got to be willing to put our faith to work. You've you got to get in. You say, well, what do you mean? I mean that in verse 8, God says, Joshua, I've already given the battle to you. I've already put them in your hands and not one of them will stand against you. And then at verse nine, we see Joshua march all night long to get in the fight. Some of you believe this Christianity is about ask and receive. In salvation, you ask in faith and you receive in grace. Some of the prayers you've been asking, there haven't been any legs on your faith. If I'd have just said, Lord, I hope there's a good church in North Central Arkansas one day, that'd have been awesome. But you know what? I had to walk it out. I had to walk it out through a pawn shop and walk it out through a bus garage and walk it out through a horse barn and walk it out wherever God would let me to walk it out. But I'd show up every day in faith, trusting that this God of the promise is still the God of the promise. Pastor Vince, I just want God to fix my marriage. Then go to work, pick up the pieces, do some heavy lifting, figure out what it's gonna take to make it work and then go to work. Pastor Vince, I just wish my kids would be better. Spend some time with them. I just wish my kids would learn to know Jesus. Then talk about him to them. Do the work. Church, we have got, I believe God can do anything. But I also believe he calls us, his people, you and I, to step into the work. Why? Because no one would ever believe it if it was just me. No one would ever believe it if it was just me. Listen, I got nothing. John says it, for without God, I'm nothing. Say, so then why does God use you? For exactly that reason. So that the world through me might see him. That's it. 
That's it. And so I, I'll pray some big stuff. I'll pray for people to be healed. Does it always happen? No. I'll pray for kids to act right. I pray, I'm stepping into it. It may not be easy. In fact, it's a hard a lot of times to step into it, to be faithful. But I'm telling you, you want the God of the answer to answer? Well, he's already given you the victory. That happened at Calvary. Happened at an empty tomb. Happened at a promise that one day, if I go, I will come again. And I'll receive you to myself. That victory has been won. Christians, we get to go home one day. That's good news. Yeah. Listen, you better hang on because if you're clapping for that, guess what? Tomorrow you go to work for the kingdom. And we better clap as much about that as we do about heaven. Because if we don't, then the world misses the story. The world misses the story. I don't want your kids to miss or your neighbors or your loved ones or your coworkers. I don't want them to miss that this God who did crazy stuff back in the day did something pretty crazy by saving me. And he did something pretty crazy by saving you so that the world through you would see him. That's all Joshua was doing here. See, he had got the promise from God. God told Joshua, I have already put them in your hands. There will not be a man stand before you, is what he told him, Jeremy. And then Joshua stood before Israel. Why? So that Israel would see the power of God through Joshua. Are you a witness like that? You have faith? I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Come on. I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. You know, do you know how idiot, easy it is? I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. Why? That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord. And he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. Come on, church. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard. And he answered, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him, that's why I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail. It's good. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Father, as, as your people, we come to you with that on our hearts. God, we may not know yet how to trust you to ask for the sun to stand still, but I believe you are the same God today that is still just as able. So Lord, for whatever, whatever the moment is in the lives of the people here, whether that be a family issue, whether that be a job issue, whether that be a health issue, God, whatever it is, give us the audacity to believe that you are a God who has already won the battle. 
And you are a God who invites us into it knowing, knowing that you are God. And Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.